so my next question is uh, about um, uh, as we can see uh, uh, you are using the symposium of plato as a historical record uh, like in in the case of dates about the wars and battles but in other cases you rejected plato's ag- accounts like when he tells us about socrates or when he tells us about aspasia so on what grounds uh, can we separate the authentic accounts and stories that plato is telling us well this is a very important and key question because the problem is we don't have vast amounts of evidence outside of plato and one other author called xenophon about socratic biography and both plato and xenophon the main biographers of socrates had a purpose in writing about socrates and that was to show the world that the man who had been executed by athens for various crimes such as not believing the city's gods introducing new kinds of gods and corrupting young men was not guilty of those charges that's what they wanted to show so they wrote these dialogues to say socrates was innocent of the charges on which he was indicted and executed so we have to accept that up to a point that deliberate purpose is going to mean that any author trying to justify socrates life and thought will skim over or elide certain facts that might be inconvenient for their purpose so that's that's one thing i would say that we have to be careful about a certain thing i'll give you a simple example Socrates was clearly associated with upper class young men so called oligarchic types people like Critias and Alcibiades who had been party to conspiracies to overthrow the democratic system in Athens or indeed had been the governing individuals in certain anti-democratic movements and Socrates was deeply associated with them he was considered to be their teacher but Plato didn't want to show and Xenophon didn't want to show that Socrates was anti-democratic himself and that he somehow approved the uh, behavior of the individuals such as Critias and the so-called 30 tyrants in 404 BC who set up a junta which was very cruel and very oligarchic and very anti-democratic and so the story that plato tells puts in socrates mouth is that he was a an opponent sort of he 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 passively opposed he didn't fight critias but he refused to carry out what he considered to be an illegal order so we get this impression of socrates actually not being anti-democratic and when the 30 tyrants were overthrown in 403 BC and then uh, a trial eventually took place in which Socrates had to defend himself one of the things that he would have wanted to show was that he wasn't party to the kind of behavior that the 30 had uh, conducted themselves in and so um plato makes him put forward this story whether he did or not we don't know this plato's evidence for what socrates said at his trial i oppose the illegal orders of the 30 tyrants is what socrates tells us so we can say it may be true it may not be true we don't know historically what socrates did under the 30 tyrants but plato wants us to know that he wasn't approving it may be that the fact that socrates was not actually executed by these uh ter- tyrannical individuals re- was because they thought he was one of them so it's important that plato for plato to say look he wasn't one of them had he been one of them maybe uh, 
the democratic, the restored democratic constitution, which put him on trial and had him executed, would have had a point in doing so. So that's one example of the kind of thing that we need to think about when trying to look at the evidence that Plato gives for Socrates' biography. The other is what I mentioned, that uh, um, Plato really didn't know Socrates as a younger man, and so there are little hints in Plato and Xenophon of what he might have been like. Notably in the symposium, he talks about Socrates as fighting on several occasions. And the first big battle in which Socrates participates is in 432 BC, when Socrates would have been in his 30s. But it's clear that if you're going to be a fighter in the armies of Athens, a hoplite as it was known, a heavy armed infantryman, then you don't start at the age of 37, when it is the first evidence we have from Plato's symposium. But Plato doesn't tell us that. We just have to recognize that, that Socrates is an experienced fighter already at the age of 37. But like all the other Athenians who fought as heavy armed infantrymen, he would have had to have a property qualification. He would have been a reasonably wealthy man to own a panoply, a, a helmet and a breastplate and a shield and so on. And he would have started at the age of around 20. So one asks oneself, well, what is Plato not telling us about his earlier life that we can possibly deduce from the fact that Socrates was a hoplite soldier? And what might he have fought in when he was younger? And what kind of background did he come from that Plato doesn't really want us to know because he wants us to think of Socrates as a man of the people. And Socrates was undoubtedly to some degree a man of the people, but also to some extent he was very strongly associated with some of these aristocratic types that went on to try and overthrow the democracy. So Plato is eliding that kind of information. How do we try and undermine Plato's evidence? Well, one way is by looking at the evidence of Plato's pupil, Aristotle, who actually contradicts Plato in a number of cases. And you might ask, well, why does Aristotle say Plato was wrong about this or that? They're mainly trivial matters, though there's some major philosophical issues as well. But in terms of biography, for example, Aristotle tells us that Socrates had two boys from a woman called Myrto. And that woman was actually, we know, the daughter or granddaughter of an aristocratic man called Aristides. Why did Plato not tell us that? Plato only tells us that he had three children and that he had a wife or mistress called Xantippe, famous for being a difficult and demanding woman. Aristotle contradicts that. Who, who should we believe? Should we believe Plato? Or should, we, should we believe his pupil Aristotle? It seems to me if you're going to contradict, contradict someone on this trivial kind of matter, it's because you know that, that Plato got it wrong. You don't necessarily say why he got it wrong, though it's pretty obvious if you're asking uh, the question that Plato didn't want to associate Socrates with these aristocratic families. He wanted him to be a man of the people so that he could say, look, you executed him, you Athenian Democrats, wrongly. He was not an oligarchic subverter of your democratic system, as you'd like to think. Now, if he'd said, sure, he was married to Myrto, who was very much of blue blood, aristocratic Athenian family, and indeed he had his first two children from her, that might seem to undermine the picture that he's trying to give us. And so we, I think, can take Aristotle's testimony there and explain why we should, we should accept it and not Plato's more or less ass assumption. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't insist on it, he just makes us assume in two of his dialogues that Socrates' three children were all by Xantippe. Uh, now, that would mean, actually, given that Xantippe was a young woman who had just given birth when Socrates was 69 on the point of execution, that would mean that all these three children were extremely young and that they had all been born when Socrates was in his 50s or 60s. Whereas the evidence of Aristotle suggests that he'd had an earlier marriage and that he had more or less grown up at least two grown-up sons by the time he was, um, he was executed. <laughs> 